Good morning. Good morning. Oh, good morning. morning. I feel like a school teacher. Good morning. Um, okay, so before you, I'm going to jump straight on in, but before I do, was anyone here on Wednesday evening? Okay, both of us. Great. Well, if you didn't hear Terence preach, I would encourage you to uh, download that message. It was, it was phenomenal. And uh, he said something there. Yeah, just give Terence a round of applause. It was a good message. And uh, there's, there's a phrase he said in there that, that um, he said that, that relationship without sacrifice doesn't work. And it's just been going round and round in my head. But if you want to hear more about that, then I would just encourage you to download that message. It was, it was incredibly powerful. But this morning, something different. So this is part two of a message I preached about six years ago. So <laughs> it's taken a while for me to get some time to actually put this together. But hopefully you can remember the first message. And that message, the title of that message, not this one, was... Um, your happiness is not God's highest priority. It was uh, very popular. (laughs) Everyone went away really depressed. But anyway, so this is part two, so hopefully you'll go out in tears at the end of this one. It's my aim in life, to upset you. But actually, the message on this, I don't know if we've got a title on this or not, if we haven't, I can just tell you that, can we be happy? Can we be happy? No, is the answer. Okay, have a good day, and um, enjoy the bank holiday weekend. Can we be happy? I want to look at, okay, so if happiness is not God's highest priority for us, then can we be happy? And I want to read to you from Psalm 1, a really well-known psalm. So let's do that first. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in season, whose leaf, leaf does not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. It's a really well-known psalm. I can remember my girls learning this at Oakwood, and they wander around. And I remember the first bit, blessed is the man, blessed is the man, blessed is the man. But blessed is the man. And that word blessed, if you look at that in the Amplified, is happy. Happy is the man. Happy, all woman. Happy is the man, all woman. Who's, who walks in the counsel of the ungodly. Who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, just checking. Blessed, happy. And that New Testament word, blessed or happy, is the word makaros, makaros, and that's right, which means flourishing. And I did a bit of research, and flourishing, according uh, to the positivepsychology.com, that well-known website, says this, flourishing is the product of of the pursuit and engagement of an authentic life that brings inner joy and happiness through meeting goals, being connected with life, passions, and relishing in accomplishments through the peaks and valleys of life. So to flourish is to be happy, is to be contented, to be at peace, at rest. And my question this morning to you is, are you happy? Are you happy? And if you're not consistently happy, then why not? That's the first question. Are you happy? I haven't got to answer it. And I'm not talking about just happy from time to time, happy when things are going well, happy when... Because that word happy is a bit... It's a bit kind of... Isn't it happy? Are you flourishing? Are you at rest? Are you at peace? Is life good? Are you happy? Okay. And that's my first question, is, is are you happy? And the second one, this is a bit more challenging, because you probably, as, as believers, you think, yeah, I know where you're going with this. All right, so, if, so Psalm 1, happy is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Maybe you've put the dots together, you've joined it up. So if you're not consistently happy, but you know this, then why aren't you happy? Just let that sink in. If you know that happy is the man who doesn't do these things and does these things, then why aren't you happy? Hmm. You, can, you think, because oh, I'm not doing those things, maybe. Or I am doing the other things. Maybe. I'm not saying, you don't worry, go away feeling guilty. That's not the p- point of this. We do get to better stuff. But the question is, is are you happy? And Psalm 1 tells us something that it really is, is radical. It tells you that you can be happy. Really? Yeah, it says there, happy is the man who does these things. So therefore, happiness, consistent happiness... I'm not talking about joviality. Can't you hate people like that? 
It's good, isn't it, coming from, a, from the pulpit? Just people that are always kind of, yeah, life's great, isn't it wonderful? Yeah, life isn't always great. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter who you are, how much money you have, where you live, life is not always great. There's always stuff that comes along and just muddies the water, isn't there? There's always stuff. But are you, despite that, because the Psalm 1 doesn't put any conditions to this, are you consistently happy? Most of us probably say, no, we're not. Maybe, maybe over a bank holiday weekend, we're happier than a normal Monday morning, but we're not consistently happy. You see, most of us start out life believing that happiness is possible, don't we? We start out as, as children believing that happiness is the natural state of things, unless you've had a, you know, a, a sad childhood, but we generally think that happiness is the general state of where we'll be. Of course, we see people that aren't happy, we see people that, that definitely are not happy, but that's because they've made bad choices in life, right? They've, they've made mistakes, they've done things wrong, they've made, like I say, bad choices, but as long as we make good choices, as long as we make the right decisions, as long as we take good counsel, as long as we marry the right person and, and, and pay attention at school and get our qualifications and get the right job, then we'll be happy. Those people that aren't happy, that's because they've made bad choices. And that's why they're not happy. But then as we get older, we realise that's just a load of bump. That's not true at all, isn't it? It's not true at all that, that the reason that people aren't happy isn't because they've made bad choices, it's because life is sometimes challenging. Life is hard. Life hasn't dealt us a fair hand, as we'd say. That's why they're not happy. And so we begin to migrate from being, yeah, life is, is in automatically happy, unless you make mistakes, to thinking that actually being happy is really difficult. We make that, 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 go on that journey. And all of us are somewhere on that journey. For me, they're thinking, yeah, everyone is just naturally happy, to thinking that no one's happy. We're all somewhere on that journey. And really, the question is, is where are you on that journey? Are you still in that stage of thinking, yeah, happiness is the natural state of man? Or, nah, I don't really believe that anyone can be happy. Well, Psalm 1 tells us that, that we can be happy. It, it, it solves that, that question straight away. All of us can be happy. So, there are four types of people when it comes to happiness. Probably more, but I have four here. First, those who think happiness is natural, like I just said. That's the first type of person that think happiness is natural. And maybe those people are either very naive or they've lived a very sheltered life but they th or they're very young and they think happiness is the natural state of man. That's the first type of person. Second one, opposite end of the spectrum, happiness is unachievable. It's just, yeah, life sucks. Happiness is unachievable. Everyone's like, oh, I'm glad this isn't a not paid, paid concert, Craig. I'm like, oh man, this is depressing. Happiness is unachievable. The third one, where most of us are, is that we're migrating from the first one to the second one. So we're not sure. You know, the, 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 the verdict is out, the, the jury's out at the moment. So, yeah, I'm not sure, maybe you shouldn't necessarily be happy, but I don't really believe you can be happy. We're, we're somewhere on that journey. That's probably most of us. And then there is the fourth group, that they understand what the Bible says about happiness, that is, is neither natural or unachievable, but it is possible. It's neither natural or unachievable, but it is possible. That's the fourth group of people. And hopefully, when you leave this morning, you'll be in that fourth group. That you think, yeah, well, it, it's not natural, and it's not unachievable, but I'm, I'm convinced that it's possible. As long as, I, as long as I live according to what God's Word says, it is possible. So, if it's possible, if happiness is possible, if that flourishing life is possible, then why do so few of us consistently have that happiness, that joy inside of us? I'm not talking about just sometimes, because all of us are happy sometimes, right? You know, when we get a tax rebate, or um, when the kids actually do what they're told, or um, the sun shines, or something, we're all happy from time to time, right? But I'm talking about being consistently happy, consistently flourishing. Remember, I'm not talking about smiling from ear to ear. I'm not talking about, you know, continually laughing or being jovial. I'm talking about being content, at rest, that we feel like we're flourishing. Do you understand what I'm saying? That the life is generally good, 
that I'm happy, I'm content. So if, if that is possible, then why aren't we consistently walking in it? Why aren't we consistently happy? Well, let's look again at Psalm 1, okay? We see a tree planted by rivers of water. That's what it says in Psalm 1, like a tree planted by the rivers of living water. So this tree, and here's, here's the thing, is subject to exactly the same conditions as all the other trees, right? The same storms, the same sunshine, the same snow, the same weather, the same wind, it's subject to exactly the same conditions, right? And this is the first mistake that I think we make as Christians, is that we think that somehow, by being a Christian, we are no longer going to be subject to the same conditions that all the other trees are subject to, that aren't planted by the rivers of water. Let me say that again. We think, or we, we, we consent to, whether we do it intentionally or whether it's unintentional, we consent to the idea that that, that as a Christian, as this tree, that we're not going to be subject to the same conditions that all the other trees are subject to. All the storms the other trees face, all of the droughts the other trees face, all of the, the snow and the weather and the wind and the, you know, the, 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 the storms of life, that we somehow are going to be sheltered from that. We're going to be kept from that. That's not what it says, is it? No, it says that, that this tree, even though it's subject to, to all of the other conditions, its leaf does not wither. It's still subject to the same challenges. And that, for some of us, maybe that's a wake-up call. We believe, you know, you come to Christ, you get saved, and all of a sudden, all the storms stop. All of the challenges stop. All of the sickness stops. All of the needs stop. Your bank account suddenly goes right into the, you know, it's just everything's good all of a sudden. And then we find out actually that's not true, is it? In fact, sometimes it just feels worse because now you have an enemy. You didn't have an enemy before, and now you do. Do you realize that? When you, before you came to Christ, you didn't have an enemy because you were in the world. The, Satan wasn't bothered about you. Now you're, you're, now you're in, in the kingdom of God. Now you have an enemy. <laughs> Welcome to Christianity. <laughs> yeah, praise God. So, you know, here we are. We have this, this situation where we think, that as Christians we're not going to be subject to trials and struggles and needs. But Romans 8.35 says this. It says this, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? It's good news, right? That bit's good. Who shall separate us from the, from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or the sword? As it is written, For your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep to the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, here in Romans, we're told again and again and again that we're going to experience tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, the sword, and we're going to be killed all day long. Is anyone feeling happy yet? Because it, there's no doubt about it. There is no doubt about it that we as trees planted by rivers of living water are going to face exactly the same trials as everybody else. And if you were sold a different Christianity, then you were missold. You can claim that back like the PPI, you know, and just, I was missold this. It's not true. Sorry about that. But there is good news coming, so don't leave just yet. Stay with me, all right? So let's go back to Psalm 1 again, about this tree planted by the rivers of living water. This person, this tree, this person, is more than just a religious person. They're more than just a good person. Yeah, that's not what Christianity is about. It's not about being religious, not about being good, not about good works. This person, this tree, is planted or rooted in something that goes beyond themselves. This tree is planted in something or someone that goes beyond themselves. We we're just talking about the circumstances, right? The things that life come, brings along, the, the unexpected 
illnesses, the unexpected bills, the, the challenges, work, family, relationships, all of those things that we know we're going to have to face, the circumstances. You see, this tree is a tree that is actually, regardless of whether there's a drought or not, it's still flourishing. So really, this tree's flourishing, this tree, tree's happiness, is not dependent upon the circumstances. Yeah? It's, it, it's happiness, which that's such a, a lame word, but this happiness, this, this flourishing, this contentedness, this rest, this peace, this blessedness, as a Christian word there, this, this life is not dependent upon the circumstances. But so often, as believers, we're looking to change the circumstances. Yeah, we don't want all of that. Of course no one wants that struggle. No one wants that. But we, we think, oh, if I could just eliminate all of those problems and all of those challenges and all of those needs and all of those circumstances, well, then I'd be happy. Come on. You say, oh, I would be happy, but, you know, the car's just got to have four new tyres. You know, or I would be happy, but you keep on doing this. I would be happy, but I just don't enjoy my job. I would be happy, but this. I would be. So we are waiting, or, or even, you know, take that a step further, you know, let's all pray. Let's pray about my job. Let's pray about my job's fine, by the way. Let's pray about my job. Let's pray about my family. Let's pray about my kids. Let's pray about my wife. Let's pray about my health. Because then, if we can just somehow bring down enough power, enough force to change that, then I'll be happy. But that's not what Psalm 1 says, is it? It says that all of this stuff is going on, but this tree is happy anyway. So what we want is to find out the secret of this tree, right? We want to be able to be happy, be fruitful, be contented, flourish, even though the circumstances are not naturally conducive to that. Do you see where I'm going? Yes? Okay. Um, completely lost myself. Oh yeah, okay. So let's go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter 1 verse 6. It says this. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now, if for a little while, you've had to suffer various trials. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now, if for a little while, you have to suffer various trials. That, that we, trials there means grief, heaviness, deep distress and turmoil. Love these encouraging verses. <laughs> so, even though you've had to suffer grief, heaviness, and deep distress and turmoil, you greatly rejoice. It doesn't say this, you used to rejoice, yet, yet now you are in heaviness. You used to rejoice, but now you are in heaviness. And it doesn't say, you are rejoicing in him because you are avoiding heaviness. I'll just say that again. There's, there's a difference. Let me read it to you. So it says, in this you greatly rejoice, even though now you are going through trials. It doesn't say, you used to rejoice, but now you're going through trials. And it doesn't say, you are rejoicing because you're not going through trials. There's two present tenses. You are going through trials and you are rejoicing. They're both happening at the same time, which is not the natural state of things for most of us, is it? Come on. I, I was moaning to, to John and Terence earlier on. I got like a thorn in my hand yesterday. Right in my hand. And I can't even see it, it's so small. And I was complaining about it, you know. Ah, oh. Helen, said, Helen said this morning, oh, isn't it? It's beautiful outside. I said, yeah, yeah, but I'll just get this thorn out of my hand. <laughs> we get distracted, you know, because we, we, we don't seem to balance those two things. I'm not calling this is a great trial, but, we, you know, we, we go through discomforts. You know, we're not happy. When we go, I'll get the thorn out and I'll be happy. But that's not what it's saying. It's saying you've got both of these things at the same time, rejoicing and trial. Yeah, and that's not just something that you can switch on. You know, I've heard this so many times, and it, it's one of those things that really just gets me. When someone is struggling, when someone has, is grieving, when someone is going through a difficult time, you say, well, you should just rejoice. <laughs> yeah, praise God. <laughs> Maybe I'll thump you and then you can rejoice that your nose is bleeding. <laughs> I, I'm joking. You know, I've never thumped anyone. I'm one. Um, that's not biblical. 
Jesus was known as a man of griefs. Yeah, and you read again and again, Jesus is often crying. Jesus wept. Jesus grieved. Struggling with those things is natural. Yes, when we, when we have when we lose a loved one, when we're going through sicknesses, when we're going through trials, it would be stupid for you to have a smile from ear to ear and just be like, yay! No, that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about an inner flourishing and a rest and a peace, even though outwardly, yeah, you are crying and you are struggling, but inwardly there is something that goes beyond that. Yeah, so if you're in this situation, if you know, you're feeling tearful or emotional or you're struggling with things, I'm not saying to you, you should be smiling about it. And I, I wouldn't listen to anyone who says that to you either. I'll just, come on, just smile. Praise the Lord anyway. That's not what this is saying. That's not what it's saying. It's saying there's actually, there's something that's a lot deeper than that. There's something that holds you steady, that, that gives you this inflow of rest and peace and flourishing and a, I know it's going to be okay. Deep down, I know it's going to be okay kind of thinking. Even though on the outside, maybe you're having a time of, of crying and weeping. All right, so I'm not telling you you should be smiling all the time. Please don't do that. <laughs> it's just creepy. All right. Yeah, Isaiah 53 says, he was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. So, we're going to get to how do we get to happiness. But before I do that, someone who understands this, someone who understands what I'm going to say to you, is in a time of suffering, in a time of, of challenge, in a time of... Um, of what naturally should be despair, right? This actually causes happiness. That's radical, right? That this way of thinking, now happiness, again, I'm gonna keep saying this, I'm not talking about smiling. This flourishing, this rest, this being at peace actually increases as the pressure increases. Why? Because Psalm 1 tells us that this tree is a tree planted by the rivers of living water. So in the drought, in the, excuse me, in the storms, in, the, in the, the challenges, the roots go down deeper into the water. And this tree is contented and is aware that the other trees don't have what it has. That this has a consistent supply of water, consistent supply of what it needs. So in the storms, it puts down its roots even more into this external life. And that's something to remember, that this joy is not something that comes from you. It's not something that comes from just stirring yourself up. Come on, pull yourself together, stiff up a lip and all that. You know, it's not that. And it doesn't come from God just pouring it out on you. No, it comes from this relationship that we have with Christ. It comes from having our roots into something beyond us, beyond the natural, beyond the human, beyond the emotional. It comes from something beyond that. It has this, it's a relationship with God. Like I said, if you, if you listen to um, Trevor's message from, from uh, Wednesday, he talks a bit about that relationship with God. It's, it, it ties in well. Um, so this, this, this type of life, actually causes, switches on happiness in trials. It switches on this rest. When the trial hits, we switch into, we switch into this. We switch into this rest, into this contentedness. Okay, so how do we get happiness? I'll tell you that in part three. <laughs> okay, how do you get happiness? All right, so... Here's a thing, okay, sorry, here's a thing. But happiness cannot be found directly. Let me just say that again. If you come and said, I'm not happy, hopefully you won't say that at the end of the sermon, but you say, I'm not happy, can you pray for me to be happy? And I say, okay, I just pray that, that Neil's happy. I'm sure Neil is happy, but I'm just picking on him because I've just seen that. So happiness doesn't come that way. It's not a thing in itself. You can't just get happiness. In fact, happiness is a byproduct of seeking something higher. You can't seek happiness. 
Well, you can, but you won't get it. You see, it doesn't say anywhere in Scripture that blessed is the man who seeks happiness. Blessed is the man who seeks to be blessed. It doesn't say that, does it? There's always another attachment to it. You've got to be seeking something different. You've got to be seeking something else other than happiness to get happiness. It doesn't say, blessed is the man who hungers and thirsts for blessedness. No, what is it? Blessed is the man who hungers and thirsts for righteousness. You see, you seek righteousness, you get happiness. You seek happiness, you don't get happiness, and you don't get righteousness. You, you can't seek happiness. The minute you begin to seek happiness, it, it's like grasping at the wind. It's like trying to catch tomorrow. You can't do it. You can't seek to be happy and get happiness. Because we'll go, mm, do I believe that? We're not going to say heads, we've literally got the heads on the side out there, don't look round. But <laughs> you cannot seek to be blessed and be blessed. You can't. You can only seek righteousness. So, if we know that, I'm not saying anything new because it's here in Scripture. If you know that, why aren't you happy? If I know that, why am I not happy? The answer's there, isn't it? Because you're seeking happiness. It's natural to seek happiness. Sorry, this is a bit hard hitting, isn't it? We're seeking to be happy. And the, cause we're seek, seeking to be happy because I bet when I said to you, is happiness, can we be happy? And we thought, oh great, I'm going to learn how to be happy. That's what I want, I want to be happy. We all want to be happy. So we seek to be happy. But by seeking to be happy, we don't get it. You think this is, this is getting a bit complicated. All right, let me read this through Matthew 6, right? Jesus says this in Matthew 6. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. Jesus is saying, you're seeking to be happy, right? And you're worrying about those things, and because you're worrying about those things, you're not happy. You're missing the point. If you seek first the kingdom of God, then you'll get the kingdom of God and you'll get happiness. If you seek happiness, you don't get any of it. You think, yeah, there's got to be, there's got to be another way, right? <laughs> this doesn't sound fair. I just want to be happy. I don't want all that other stuff. I just want to be happy. God made me happy. Sorry. It's not the way this works. You can't just be happy. Sorry. Dead silence. <laughs> okay. Um, why not? Why not? Okay, let me try to explain. Why doesn't this work? Well, we say, okay, yes, I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God. I'm gonna, I'm, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go home and I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God. Right? I'm going to seek to live according to what God's word says. All right? So we see this, this one power working within us. Yes, I'm, I'm going to seek righteousness. I'm going to seek God. I'm going, to, I'm going to seek him and then I'll be happy. That's what Simon's saying, right? So if I seek first the kingdom of God, then I'll be happy. But then we hit up against something, right? So we say, well, yeah, there's a situation happening at work. Yeah, if I say something, if I do that, I'm going to get in trouble. Yeah, and then I won't be happy, right? So if I, if I do what I know is right, yeah, I won't be happy. So I'm not, I'm not going to do that exactly. I'm going to do, I'm going to take the easy option, right? I'm going to do this. Or we think this situation, this relationship, yeah, if I was to say something or do something, then yeah, I, you know, I wouldn't be happy. So what we're saying here is, is that we're happy to seek the kingdom of God until such a point as it impacts upon our happiness. True? You can see the order of things there, can't you? Yeah, I'm happy, uh, different word, I'm content to seek the kingdom of God until such a time as seeking the kingdom of God first impacts upon my happiness, at which point you stop seeking the kingdom of God, you start seeking happiness, and you haven't got it anymore. We, we, it's, a, it's a trap we fall into. So we're saying, yeah, the kingdom of seeking the kingdom of God is pretty high up on my agenda. Maybe even number two. 
You know, I'm going I'm to seek God. That's, that's almost, almost at the top, just underneath being happy. Um, so I'll keep seeking the kingdom of God right up to the point where it impacts on me being happy and then I'll stop seeking it because God wants me to be happy, right? God wants me to be happy. So we don't actually achieve happiness because we keep going, we keep going, we keep going, we keep going, we keep going until something happens thinking, yeah, God wants me to be happy, I'm not doing that. Like, I don't know, sharing the love of God with someone, giving a, 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 a financial gift to someone that's going to cost you something, Right? Again, uh, Terence was saying about, you know, you, you sometimes you've got to lay down your phone or turn the television off and have that conversation with someone, something that's causing you happiness, or you think, oh, I like doing that, or stop doing that and do this. And when you do this, you'll get that as well, right? So we're, we're content to seek first the kingdom of God until such a time as it impacts upon our happiness, and then we're no longer content to do it. Then we want happiness. We have this priority. And hopefully you're feeling this, like, check in your spirit right now. Yeah, I do that. Um, I, will, I will live right, I will do right, I will, I will believe the word of God right up to the point where I think, yeah, that's not going to make me happy doing that, and then I'll stop doing it. That's why you're not consistently happy. That's why you might be happy for a while, but then when you know you should do something and you don't do it, that's when happiness switches off, because you are no longer seeking the kingdom of God. You are seeking to be happy. Okay. See, there's two ways that we can come to God, and this really is a good indicator of where we are on the whole spectrum of things. This right here. How we react in trials shows how we have come. In other words, how we react in a situation shows how we've come to God. In other words, why has this happened to me? Right? Why has this happened to me? What good has being a Christian done for me? I, I, I believe the word of God, I came to Christ, I gave my life to him, and now look at this. Look at this fine situation, look at my health, look at my home, look at my job, look at this. What good has it done me? What good has it done me? If that's where we are, then we don't understand the kingdom of God. Because we can come one of two ways. One coming that we believe God owes us everything. He owes us everything. Come to me and you'll be blessed and happy and have peace and joy and prosperity and health. All of these things, we come to God and we think, that's what I'm expecting for you. You owe me this, because you said it in your word, you owe me this. Or, we come to God anyway, seeking first the kingdom. And if we get those things, then that's a bonus. Because actually, we owe God everything. He doesn't owe us, owe us anything. Where are you on that journey? It's a good indicator of where we are with seeking first the kingdom of God. If we are that sort of person, well, it's so unfair. You know, I, I've, I've lived for God, I've, I've served him, I, I tithe, I, I give, I pray, I read my Bible, I come to church twice a week, you know, I'm, I'm nice to people, all that stuff. Why has this happened to me, God? What was the point? It wasn't worth it. What a rip-off, right? That, if that's you, then you're not going to be happy. But if you have this understanding that actually God owes us nothing and as we seek first his kingdom as we live for him regardless of whether our bank account is flourishing we're healthy you know everything's going well at home regardless of those things then even in the midst of those things you will have happiness regardless of whether those things change or not there's some really kind of like I'm not sure that this is biblical going on here I tell you, it's exactly what the Word of God says. And just in closing, a personal example, okay? So, I don't want to keep going back. You know, I'm sure you're sick of the phrase, well, when I was in India, but when I was in India, <laughs> you know, we, we went out there uh, as missionaries many years ago, too many years ago, and it really sucked. We were so ill. Man, we were ill. And we had... Sickness and diarrhea, you know, like it was going out of fashion. We just, we were ill, it was hot, I didn't understand the culture, and I wanted to come home. In fact, I remember calling Pastor Robin and saying, I want to come home. You know, <laughs> watch the kids get ill, got dengue fever, cross that off your bucket list, that's no fun. <laughs> All of these things that happened, right? But we chose to stay there because we knew that God had called us to do it. And as we stayed... 
as we stayed, I can remember the day when I suddenly realised, I'm happy. I'm content here. Those things hadn't changed. Still spending way too much time in the bathroom. <laughs> still not feeling very well. Still, you know, struggling with culture. Still, all of those things were still happening. But all of a sudden, these roots are into something beyond me. I'm happy. I'm doing, I, I'm happy. I'm, I'm contented. I'm flourishing. Maybe not physically, but I am flourishing in this environment. And I, I remember Helen saying, you know, she was teaching Bible school and she suddenly realised, this is what I was made to do. This is what I was made to do. She's happy. Why? Because there's loads of money in the bank, because, because we're, the kids are well, because, because, you know, we've got a nice car, because we, we've got... No. All of a sudden we're seeking first the kingdom of God and now, even though those things haven't changed, we're happy. It's true. When... Trust me, it's true. When you begin to seek him first, seek to be that father, seek to be that husband, seek to be that wife, seek to be that son, seek to be that, that, that colleague, seek to be that at your cost, regardless of whether you're happy or not, regardless of whether you're feeling blessed or not, regardless of whether the bank account is full or your body feels well, regardless, when you seek to do that, when you seek first the kingdom of God, to represent the kingdom of God, to reveal the kingdom of God, these things will be added to you. It doesn't mean, and, and maybe I can almost hear the, you know, the, the cogs, cogs going around, all oh, right then, all oh, right, yeah, okay, and so I will seek first the kingdom of God and then God's going to put money in my bank account and I'm going to get well. That's not what I'm saying. If that's what you're hearing, then I've done a bad job. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying it's kind of like a, a back door into God's pocket. That's not how this works. Oh, I just pull the wool over God's eyes by, by seeking first the kingdom of God, or at least making it look that way, and then he's going to bless me with all of these things. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying when our attitude changes, when we begin to seek first, truly, truly seek first the kingdom of God, not seeking it as a route to happiness, but seek first the kingdom of God, even if you don't get those things, as you truly begin to seek those things, God will add happiness to you. You will begin to flourish. You will begin to, to feel, oh, I'm at rest. I'm at peace. I've found my place in the world. I know what I'm supposed to be doing. Life is good. And it may not have changed. It may not have changed. You might still be sick. You might still be in need. You might still not be in the job that is the one you want to be doing. I want to be a, 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 an astronaut, but it's not going to happen. You know, I'm not clever enough for that, and I don't know anyone who's got a rocket. It's not going to happen. But I can be happy where I am because I know that I'm seeking his kingdom. I don't always get it right. don't always do it. But when I'm praying in the mornings, when I'm driving to work, and Father, I thank you that there's opportunities today. I thank you. Father God, that, that I can reveal you today, that you can manifest through me. Lord, help me to make the right decisions. Help me to reveal you. Help me to do what's right, to live what's right, to speak right, to behave right. Help me. Can't do it on my own. Help me. I'm seeking you, Lord. I'm seeking you. And he begins to bring you that peace and that rest and that contentedness right where you are. So this morning, just as, as Janet um, plays, I just want to say to you, are you consistently happy? Are you happy? Are you so cynical that you think, oh, I can never be happy? Or are you that in the first camp that says, yeah, happiness is a natural state until I do something wrong? I would just challenge you this morning. Don't struggle with this any longer. Ask God, because we can't do this on our own. We can't do it on our own. Ask God to help you to seek first his kingdom. And he'll begin to put little checks in your spirit, little indicators. Yeah, that's not my best for you. That's not the way you need to, that's not the way you need to speak. That's not the way you need to react. That's not the way you need to behave. That's not the way you need to give. That's not the way you need to respond. Just, he just begins to put little checks in your spirit. And you know, you say, oh, I don't hear the Holy Spirit. Yeah, you do. You just ignore it. Come on, you know. Yeah, I know I shouldn't say this, but that's just the way I am, girlfriend. So get over it. No, don't, don't be that way. Listen to the Holy Spirit. 
listen to him, listen to that. And as you begin to listen to him and act upon him, even though things may not outwardly be changing, inwardly you will find that happiness, that flourishing. Right in the midst of the trials you're in, I don't know what trials you're facing, I don't know what you're going through, I don't know what your needs are, but you will begin to flourish. Those things may not change, but you will begin to flourish. If you're able, shall we just stand together as we close in prayer? Father, I thank you that you know, you know things that we're going through. You know the trials. You know the storms of life. You know the things that no one else does. You know our disappointments, our hurts, our struggles. You see the tears that we've cried when no one else has seen them. You know, Father God, the, the desires and the ambitions of our heart, the things that maybe haven't come to pass and the things where we thought would go, but they didn't go that way. You know, Lord. And you know what it is to, to suffer loss. You know what it is to be in need. You know what it is, Father. And this morning, I would pray, God, for each of my brothers and sisters here, Lord, that you would help us to stop seeking the answers to those things and to start to seek you. Lord, to hunger and to thirst after righteousness. Lord, help us. Put it in us. Holy Spirit, stir it in us this morning to begin to hunger after those things. And Lord, I thank you then as, as we begin to really push seeking the kingdom to the top of the list, that you will grant us your rest and your peace and that flourishing life in the midst of these circumstances, Father. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. Amen. Amen. Well, hopefully you feel happy or you know how to be happy. Have a happy day. Enjoy the bank holiday and we'll see you on Wednesday. Thank you.